Hello, I'm Orla Smith, Managing Editor of Science Translational Medicine. Welcome to our first Science Translational Medicine live chat. Today, I will be chatting with Dr. Michael Failings, a neurosurgeon from Toronto, Canada, and Dr. Martin Schwab, uh, a neuroscientist from Zurich, Switzerland. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank so you today for we'll be discussing. So today we will be discussing new experimental therapies in the pipeline for treating spinal cord injury and the many challenges to getting these therapies into the clinic and into patients. And we welcome our audience and um, we would ask our audience to please post your questions for Dr. Phelan and Dr. Schwab in the comments section at the bottom of the live chat web page. So uh, maybe I could um, start off by uh, asking Dr. Failings, so what are the options currently available for patients that arrive at the hospital with severe spinal cord injury? Well, the management of spinal cord injury has been dramatically changed in the last 20 to 25 years. And what's been recognized is that time is spine. And the concept is that the first uh, hours after a spinal injury are time critical. So what's essential is the initial management um, and the, um, the maintenance of spinal stability, the transfer of a patient to, a, uh, to an acute spinal center. Uh, we recognize that the management of blood pressure, the uh, maintenance of the airway and the breathing, um, the vital signs is critically important. And it's critically important to maintain the circulation uh, to the spinal cord and to maintain the, the blood pressure. It's also recognized that imaging has really transformed the way we manage individuals with a, an acute spinal cord injury. And we, we, we now recognize through the STASCIS trial that was published in the past year that the timing of, um, of surgical intervention is critical and that it is important to decompress the, um, the, the spinal uh, cord, which is frequently compressed as a result of the injury, and it's also important to reconstruct the, uh, the spinal column. So that's been a significant change. The critical care management is, is vital um, in terms of optimizing the, uh, the recovery and the prevention of secondary complications. Uh, the use of steroids is an option in certain uh, patients to try to attenuate some of the inflammatory uh, events that occur after injury. And then it is recognized that after the acute phase of injury, early um, intervention with rehabilitation to um, enhance um, endogenous plasticity and the recovery mechanisms is vitally important. And so these events have really transformed the care of patients with an acute spinal injury over the last 20 years. So thank you. And Dr. Schwab, what experimental therapies are currently being tested preclinically in animals and also in early phase one clinical trials? So maybe we should briefly look at the injured spinal cord and see how it looks like on the uh, anatomical and histological level. Of course, uh, all the movements that we do, if we write, if we uh, stand up, if we walk, if we run, are uh, coordinated by uh, so-called motor neurons which sit in the spinal cord and which electrically excite our muscles. This is how this goes. Uh, and then the spinal cord, in the case of locomotion and our legs, the spinal cord is controlled by the so-called motor centers of the brain, which sit in the brain stem and in the forebrain cortex. So these command systems, which run from the brain down to the spinal cord, uh, run in fiber bundles, which uh, literally uh, contain hundreds of thousands, up to millions of nerve fibers. And a spinal cord injury disrupts these nerve fibers mechanically by bone fragments or by strong compression. Now, if these nerve fibers are interrupted, they degenerate from the injury site down to the lower part of the spinal cord. But the upper part of the nerve fiber from the brain to the injury site, they remain. So uh, attempts to repair spinal cord injuries today are attempts to make these interrupted uh, nerve fibers regrow from the site of injury to their former target in the spinal cord. And the uh, preclinical 
um, experiments which have been done over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, and now also the first clinical trials, uh, use uh, procedures which stimulate the regrowth of these fibers, uh, which can be done in various ways, uh, among other uh, by uh, taking so-called growth inhibitory factors uh, away. Uh, we also try to bridge the injury site uh, to implant stem cells, for instance, uh, at the injury site to improve the conditions for the regenerating fibers. And last, of course, there is rehabilitation, so uh, trying to uh, to use what is left, often times the injury disrupts 80-90% of the fibers, but not 100% of the fibers, and the remaining fibers can be trained and triggered to uh, serve uh, more functions that they originally had. And so maybe we could, uh, I could invite you to say a few words about your study that was uh, published yesterday in Science Translational Medicine, Dr. Schwab, where in fact you use deep brain stimulation in rats to try and activate those few remaining um, white matter tracts in the spinal column. Exactly. This is uh, uh, precisely, uh, as you say, a procedure which is based on the fact that 5 or 10 percent of the fibers remain. Uh, so this is an experimental study in rats. The rats were not able to locomote with so few fibers. Uh, however, what we discovered was that when we stimulate uh, so-called brain locomotor center, which is a very old center that all animals have, from fish uh, to uh, uh, monkeys and man also. If we stimulate this center with appropriate uh, physiological electrical stimuli, then these few fibers which are there uh, act as a control system uh, which allow the animal, in this case, to swim or to uh, walk uh, over brand. And um, you had mentioned rehabilitation, so Dr. Failings, um, there's been a lot of interest in robotic assist devices, for example, like the Exobionics exoskeleton for helping in the rehabilitation of spinal cord injury uh, patients. Um, can you maybe comment on uh, the state of the art for these devices? Well, to take a step back, um, the rehabilitation is acutely uh, a link to the changes in the, uh, the acute phase of, of, of injury. And we're seeing more and more patients who are recognized as having incomplete lesions. And, and, and Professor Schwab alluded to this, the idea that although the injury appears to be very severe, there are some pathways which are preserved. And this becomes critically important. And the more that we can preserve in the acute phase of, of, of injury through neuroprotective approaches, through early surgical intervention, the more this then enables rehabilitative approaches. And one of the interesting strategies that's emerged out of, out of rehabilitation is the use of assistive devices. Um, um, brain computer interfaces and, and other modalities to try to um, enhance a neurologic um, a, a function. One of the modalities which you've alluded to are, are, are the use of devices that potentially can take advantage of, of neural circuits that are intact. One can amplify these neural circuits and then we can use these to, uh, to move um, uh, paralyzed parts of the body. A very simple example of this are the use of bionic gloves in which um, individuals who are tetraplegic without uh, functional use of their hands can recover the use of, uh, of their hands by, by um, activating um, uh, circuits in their upper limbs and transmitting these um, in, into the hands. And then there are other examples of these types of interfaces that are being used to try to enhance uh, neural circuits. And uh, we have a number of really great questions from our audience. Um, several people have asked about the difference in treating acute spinal cord injury versus chronic injury where someone's been paralyzed for many years. And so I think it would be interesting to hear both clinically from Dr. Failings and also about uh, preclinical models of acute versus chronic spinal cord injury. 
Well, there are different phases of spinal cord injury, and each of these phases of spinal cord injury presents unique opportunities and challenges. We recognize that spinal cord injury acutely um, is a, is a two-step process. We have an initial injury, which we call the primary mechanical injury, and this is related to the trauma that, that occurs. And this is, this is the most important factor in terms of the ultimate injury. And then there is something called the secondary um, uh, injury phase, so that after the primary mechanical injury, there are uh, cellular and molecular events that, caught, that amplify uh, the injury. And this is an important target for potential intervention. Then as the injury evolves, there are healing processes that occur, and these healing processes are important in terms of limiting the secondary injury, and these include inflammation as well as the formation of a scar. And these are important in terms of the intrinsic healing from the injury, but also have, are, represent a two-edged sword. And so one of the critical differences between the acute and the subacute phases of the injury and the chronic lesion represents the formation of a glial scar. The glial scar represents um, a limitation to um, endogenous repair and regeneration. And uh, one of the challenges in terms of the application of regenerative and reparative uh, uh, processes to the chronic lesion uh, relates to how one deals with the glial scar. And there are ways to do this through um, enzymatic approaches such as chondroitinase, through, um, um, a bioengineered strategies including self-assembling peptides to try to uh, target these um, uh, approaches. And in addition, there are intrinsic inhibitory uh, molecules, which I'm sure Dr. Schwab will, will talk about, which one can potentially target to try to enhance the uh, reparative and regenerative responses following uh, injury. Dr. Schwab, what about preclinical models um, to model both acute and chronic spinal cord injury? So this is entirely feasible. Preclinical models in rats or mice are models where uh, either uh, very defined parts of the spinal cord are transected microsurgically or whether a real uh, clinical injury is modeled by dropping a weight onto the spinal cord, so-called contusion injuries, uh, which are very similar to what we see in the clinic in humans. Um, chronic injuries are done, are used, but of course, if they are severe, they have, the animals have the same problems that spinal injured patients have. So bladder uh, uh, control fails, uh, bladder urinary tract infections result from it and so on. One can, uh, with the appropriate uh, animal care, take care of these animals and, and have them survive uh, for, for several weeks, uh, but it is difficult. The main problem is the one that uh, Michael Failing already alluded to, the scar which grows slowly and also the endogenous uh, potential of nerve fibers to regrow which is very low to start with, can be enhanced by experimental treatments but if the fibers cannot grow because the scar blocks them over several weeks then they, as we say, down-regulate uh, further reduce their uh, regeneration capacity. So uh, that's why many of us think we should first resolve the problem where it is a little easier to solve, which is in the acute situation, and uh, once we uh, make a breakthrough there, uh, there will be ways to apply it also to the chronic condition. Great, and we have a number of uh, questions from the audience about the current status of stem cell therapies for spinal cord injury, and Nick in particular asks, um, there are promising studies in many different countries, are, are scientists cooperating internationally to try and get the best possible stem cell solution in the shortest amount of time? Well, well, st well cellular therapies come in very various different forms and and they're very heterogeneous and most most cellular therapies in fact are not actually stem cells and 
So it's important for the public to understand that there's nothing magical about these cellular therapies. They have particular indications and mechanisms of action as well as limitations. Um, there is um, a great deal of cooperation that is occurring. There have been standards and guidelines that have been formed through uh, organizations such as the ISSCR and so on for the ethical um, performance of, um, of, of, of stem cell uh, 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 studies. Uh, one of the types of uh, stem cell um, therapies that it does appear to have particular promise, which is moving forward, um, it is the use of neural stem cells to try to uh, remyelinate uh, residual nerve fibers in the injured spinal cord. And this um, uh, works on the premise that um, although patients with an acute spinal cord injury have very severe neurological dysfunction, there are some preserved nerve fibers in the injury site. The myelin, which is the insulating layer around these nerve fibers, is, 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 is damaged because the oligodendrocyte, that is the cell that myelinates these nerve fibers, is, is injured. Um, and so the concept is to go in with a neural precursor cell to try to remyelinate these um, remaining nerve fibers. So this is an example of a therapeutic strategy that which has emerged. Uh, from basic science work, very strong um, mechanistic work, and is now moving through very early phase clinical trials. Um, it's also important um, if there are people in the audience who have a spinal cord injury or family members to, re to realize that currently um, stem cell treatment, stem cell therapies for spinal cord injury are experimental. There is no accepted medical treatment for spinal cord injury involving stem cells. And so it's very important if you're considering this as a potential option to really be very, very aware of this, to do very careful research, to ask many questions in terms of what is the track record, what are the publications, what are the potential complications of this as well. And in general terms, when uh, scientists and physicians are doing clinical trials, uh, patients are not charged for these types of experimental uh, treatments. Uh, Dr. Schwab, would you like to add to that? Just very briefly to your question about <laughs> the uh, collaboration uh, among scientists and also, of course, clinicians. Um, there are, in fact, networks of clinical centers in Europe as well as in uh, North America. Uh, which uh, we, where there is a very close collaboration uh, for novel uh, treatments of spinal cord injury and one of the most advanced uh, neural stem cell trials trial which is ongoing uh, now is run by a Californian company in the uh, spinal cord injury center here in Zurich so this shows you that the collaboration around the, the globe in fact uh, is very well in place and um, uh, Jane has asked, um, there are medical scams out there, unfortunately, for um, that might be alluring to people with spinal cord injury, um, perhaps in countries where there are more lax uh, regulation of medical practices. How can patients avoid these medical scams? Well, I think it's very important for, um, for patients and families to be fully informed and there are a number of uh, excellent sources of material on the internet. Uh, the ISSCR, um, International uh, Stem Cell Collaborative uh, Research Organization, uh, the, uh, the NIH, um, uh, a, a number of organizations have very good websites that have information on reputable um, types of uh, uh, stem cell therapeutic trials. Um, it's important, uh, again, for uh, patients and families to recognize that currently stem cells are experimental. They're not an accepted form of medical treatment. And any type of a stem cell strategy um, really needs to be viewed as experimental. It should really be done in the context of a very carefully conducted clinical trial. As an ethical principle, patients and their families should not be charged for these types of treatments because it is not an accepted type of a treatment. It's also very important 
that the uh, research that the researchers and the physicians administering these types of treatments are very transparent in terms of the um, the pros and the potential cons. It's important for people to know what the source of these stem cells are and the potential risks. So one really one needs to be a very uh, informed consumer. And Dr. Schwab, did you want to add to that? Perhaps a general comment to the stem cell field. Of course, uh, stem cell therapies are uh, very much in the focus of research in a variety of medical uh, conditions at the moment. Uh, but in uh, neurology and in spinal cord injury, uh, we all realize that we are at the very, very beginning. There is a long way to go. Uh, a lot of research needs to be done. And uh, trials which are serious are based on extensive, uh, very good uh, research which is published in publications, can be looked up. Uh, so. Uh, a clinic which uh, makes promises uh, which are not based on uh, strong and internationally um, reviewed and uh, uh, research uh, is, is not what one should look at at all. This is dangerous. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to remi remind our audience again to please post your questions in the comments section at the bottom of the live chat web page. And uh, now we have a question from Brian Bard. Um, since most research is focusing on acute injuries, is it realistic to make chronic injuries acute via controlled re-injury? Uh, remember that 99.8% of us have a chronic injury. Well, the, Martin, go ahead. So uh, interestingly, this has been tried. Um, and it works to some extent experimentally. However, uh, the new injury, of course, leads to the loss of, let's say, a centimeter or so of spinal cord tissue, which was before viable tissue. And if you are uh, in a region of the spinal cord, uh, like the cervical region, this is absolutely dangerous and completely uh, contraindicated. So, Every millimeter of spinal cord tissue is very, very precious. And going in and a section, a piece of spinal cord which is still functional uh, would, would, would definitely not uh, uh, be uh, the thing to do. What we do today is try to understand what's going on with a second lesion and then with much uh, more defined uh, biochemical and pharmacological interventions. Uh, um, trigger growth. This is, in fact, what uh, the second lesion does. And Dr. Failings? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts um, just to, to complement what, uh, what Martin has indicated. So, uh, the, uh, one, one of the, the critical factors that we've alluded to earlier is the formation of the glial scar. And if one can target the glial scar, one can alter the microenvironment so that it, it resembles perhaps not an acute injury, but perhaps more a subacute um, uh, uh, injury. And so there have been efforts underway to try to target the glial scar with molecules such as chondroitinase, with, um, with um, a nano-engineered uh, approaches to try to uh, uh, um, attenuate glial scar formation. But this is one of the this is one of the one of the the significant. Uh, uh, challenges that that we uh, that we see. Um, it's likely that the 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 therapeutic strategies for a chronic spinal cord injury will involve a combination of different types of of treatments. And it also spinal cord injuries are very heterogeneous. And so an individual with a severe partial cervical lesion is going to be different from somebody who has for a virtual transection of the thoracic spinal cord. And trying to figure out ways to try to target those therapeutic strategies is going to be critically important. One of the critical factors I, I, I feel um, uh, that is going to enhance our ability to understand the heterogeneity of these lesions will be advanced imaging techniques, so advanced MRI techniques. So to try to figure out exactly what is going on in that particular um, uh, uh, individual to try to target the, um, uh, the therapies accurately. 
And uh, we have a great question here from Kate Willett. If money weren't an issue, what would the path to a cure for spinal cord injury look like? Good question there. Dr. Failing, so why don't you go first? Well, I think that um, I think spinal cord injury is is something that we can we can definitely find solutions for. Uh, are we going to cure spinal cord uh, 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 injury? I'm I'm not I'm not sure that that uh, that is necessarily going to be realistic. But I think one of the important um, uh, uh, concepts that's emerged is that even small benefits to patients can have a significant impact on their quality of life. And this, I think, is, I think, for, for myself, I think for many of my colleagues, this has been an important uh, uh, shift which has is, which is occurred, and so that we're not necessarily always thinking about the big cure, but in terms of trying to help, in, in terms of trying to help individuals. So from a broad perspective, I think one can look right from the, the continuum. We want to try to prevent injuries, so we want to look at excellent prevention, excellent infrastructure. We want to be able to take individuals with an acute injury, to, to get them to a center that knows how to treat these injuries. We want to have the best practices in place from a surgical perspective, from a critical care perspective. We would like to have acute interventions that attenuate the secondary injury process, so-called neuroprotective types of uh, drugs. We then want to understand ways to enhance endogenous plasticity. And one of the most practical ways we have to do this is with rehabilitation. But what else can we do to amplify the rehabilitation? And then as individuals start transitioning to the chronic phases of injury, how, how do we now try to repair that chronic phase of, of, of injury? We've alluded to a few of these strategies, targeting inhibitory molecules, working on the glial scar, looking at, um, at uh, stem cell approaches, in particular with uh, neural stem cell uh, approaches, and then also from an engineering perspective, looking at assistive devices, looking at, um, at engineered types of, types of solutions. So really looking at the whole continuum uh, of, 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 of care um, and putting this together, I'm, I'm confident that we could um, arrive at solutions that would help um, individuals with a spinal cord injury. And Dr. Schwab? So I think it's important to never forget that the spinal cord and the brain are really the most complex uh, system that exists on Earth. There's no machine which is so complex and does so much like our brain. And there's, of course, no machine which runs for 90 years or 100 years without uh, uh, any problem is on this document. Uh, so this is our central nervous system, this is our brain and our spinal cord. Now a bomb goes off in this uh, incredibly complex system, this is what the spinal cord injury is, and, 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 and millions of fibers are disrupted. So there's no quick fix for a spinal cord injury. This is so complex, and this is why Progress, although it's very substantial, if you look at it as scientists, uh, is still slow if you sit in a wheelchair and are waiting for the so-called cure. Importantly, uh, we need, as Michael Felix just said, a multidisciplinary approach. We need a close collaboration between the clinicians, the surgeons, between people who are specialized in inflammation, people who try to make nerve fibers grow and understand why they don't grow, like us, uh, for instance, or engineers or rehab uh, physicists, uh, physicians and physiotherapists. Many of the uh, modern centers, research centers, and also uh, foundations like the Christopher and Dana Ree Foundation or the Rick Hansen Foundation in Canada are actually very precisely sponsoring this type of interdisciplinary research. And this is how we're going to make progress. But we uh, still have a long way in front of us. And uh, Tara's question here feeds into that. How can we bring the international community of researchers, clinicians, investigators, ethical experts, policymakers, and consumers together to build consensus and proceed with evidence-based 
ethical multi-center trials with well-developed uh, outcome measures. The clock is ticking. Well, we're seeing this evolve already, and I think people get this. So spinal cord injury is an international cooperative phenomenon, and we recognize that from this perspective, we need to break down the borders and we need to reach, uh, we, we need to reach across and collaborate at an, at an international level. And, and people get this. Um, I think um, what, what, would be, what is helpful from the perspective of physicians and, and researchers is to look at mechanisms that really um, uh, uh, could facilitate um, this type of research from a regulatory perspective. And we see that, um, um, that, that there are many aspects of research that are easier now from the perspective of communications technology, such as what we're using right now with Google Plus and, and, and this type of technology, which, which has enhanced what we do. But we live in a very complex world with privacy legislation and, and various regulatory uh, challenges that we face and, 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 and trying to work through this. But certainly international collaboration is extremely, um, is extremely Im Im important. What I would, um, what I embrace as a researcher is when uh, NGOs and governmental bodies get together and have joint uh, funding solutions, um, having international consensus conferences, uh, international funding opportunities to build uh, teams of researchers. From these types of opportunities um, uh, em emerge um, a significant um, uh, advances in my view. And Dr. Schwab? So clearly uh, resources which are specifically uh, targeted at uh, collaborations, at uh, close exchange are important, but uh, it's clear that we also have a very close uh, exchange already uh, internationally. People sometimes, lay people sometimes think that uh, researchers are in their uh, laboratories and do things which are secret to the rest of the world. This is definitely not the case. We are continuously exchanging uh, our ideas and results and uh, oftentimes the experiments are so complex that we have to uh, go in a joint effort of several laboratories and also uh, clinics. There's one aspect though which is often uh, underestimated uh, by uh, lay people or by uh, also by uh, paraplegic patients. Uh, I often hear the argument, why don't you, uh, why aren't you not uh, taking more risks? Why are uh, also the, uh, um, the regulatory agencies not uh, taking more risks? Uh, I have nothing to lose. I want to try uh, an experimental procedure as soon as possible. Um, this uh, view is not exi exactly adequate. Uh, if uh, a procedure would trigger, for instance, an inflammatory process in the spinal cord, uh, then uh, very, very serious uh, consequences could result from this. So the spinal cord and the brain are, I mean, the center of uh, our um, uh, personality and, 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 and everything we are and are very, very precious. And this is why the hurdles also from the uh, regulatory agency's point of view are so high. We cannot take any risks and uh, this is an important reason why uh, progress in particular towards translation uh, is relatively slow still. Okay, we have an interesting question here from uh, Nick. Are there any plans to make an international database in order to organize all of the uh, already published um, research on spinal cord injury in order to get a bit of a better picture of what's already been done and the results, for example, various treatments, different models, and the success of each? Well, we see efforts already underway to do this in terms of international collaborations. and. In Europe, there's the um, uh, the EMSCI uh, group, which is linking um, uh, a various uh, a spinal cord injury centers in North America. We have the North American Clinical Trials Network, funded through the Christopher Reeve Foundation in Canada, the Rick Hansen Institute. Internationally, we have AO Spine, 
And in fact, AO Spine uh, currently is it has funded an effort to actually create such an international linkage of the European and the North American uh, databases. So there are already efforts that are under already efforts that are underway, and increasingly we're starting to see clinical trials um, um, moving forward at an international at an international uh, level. Um, and we see this as really a vitally important uh, step in terms of um, sharing information and in terms of linking physicians and scientists. Yeah, I would I would strongly agree to this. Um, clinically, it is very important that we have these databases and that we uh, can compare hundreds uh, and thousands of patients uh, or all individual cases uh, with their uh, very specific uh, types of lesions and recovery time courses. From the science point of view, uh, databases today are in fact uh, available mostly through uh, things like, like PubMed uh, where it's very easy to access all the publications of the last 24 years, you can look them up in detail, compare them, uh, and so on. So this is not anymore a problem today that the information uh, would not be available. And uh, Chris Powell asks about this enzyme chondroitinase, which I think you've both mentioned mm -hmm. um, pre uh, previously during the live chat, and uh, wants to know why it's not yet in uh, being used clinically for spinal mm -hmm. cord injury. Yeah. So this is. Um, this is precisely an example for what we've discussed before. Uh, chondroitinase is a bacterial enzyme purified from bacteria and injecting this into the human spinal cord uh, just requires a lot of safety precautions and uh, preliminary experiments which have not been completed yet and uh, this could turn out to, to be very disadvantageous in the end and no one, no researcher and no clinician will ever put a patient at risk uh, with, without knowing that the chance that the manipulation that he is doing, uh, the chance that the manipulation harms the patient is very, very low. And there, there, are, there are challenges um, in addition to the safety issues, there become logistical challenges around um, the potential allergic response to proteins that are created which have to be considered. And then in addition around the manufacturing of, of, of molecules, particularly when they're designed from proteins or from bacteria and trying to get sufficient quantities at a, at a given um, uh, a type of manufacturing grade can be quite challenging. So it's not so simple to take strategies from the laboratory um, 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 into the clinic and there are in fact unique challenges related to chondrotides although it is an, an extremely interesting, uh, it is an interesting uh, strategy. There are alternative routes that are also being explored to address the glial scar that ultimately may um, uh, uh, also um, uh, uh, be translated into clinical application. And uh, I'd just like to remind our audience again to please post your questions in the comments section at the bottom of the live chat uh, web page. And we have a question here from Barbara. Uh, I was told that people with cervical injuries are not eligible to participate in any kind of experiments or trials in order to avoid the risk of worsening their condition. Uh, is that true? Well, I could perhaps comment on that uh, initially. So uh, about two-thirds of injuries involve the cervical spinal cord and we need to differentiate between the acute phase of injury and the chronic uh, lesions. and. Um, um, in the acute phase of injury with neuroprotective approaches such as the Rilluzol trial which is now being launched we're, we are in fact preferentially targeting individuals with a cervical spinal cord um, uh, uh, injury and we feel that neuro, the neuroprotective approaches may have the best potential for impact in individuals with a cervical spinal uh, cord injury. In terms of patients with chronic lesions, if we consider an intervention, for example, such as a stem cell intervention, which perhaps is an invasive 
intervention where one mic surgically micro-injects the stem cells into the spinal cord. The first step, because of safety considerations, will be to try to apply this in individuals with a thoracic spinal uh, cord injury. But ultimately, the, uh, the vision will be to try to translate that into individuals with a cervical spinal cord injury. One needs to be very, very sure, however, around the safety. Um, and one has to have the technical issues very well worked out because in the cervical um, uh, region, if there is a complication that occurs, an individual could lose function, which could have devastating consequences. And so uh, because of that reason, there has been um, a process where um, in the particularly the chronic phase of, of injury, uh, we, we will first test strategies in individuals with thoracic spinal cord injuries. But I, I certainly hear a Barbara's question and the, and the vision will be to try to increasingly apply these into the cervical cord. And I have another question for Dr. Failings uh, from Nick. What is the indication for using steroids and how do you decide whether to administer them or not? Well, well, corticosteroids are an area of controversy, and in fact, I, I just was involved in a debate uh, at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons on Monday with regard to this um, uh, a, a topic. And and steroids are a two-edged sword, so they attenuate the neuroinflammatory response after after injury, so they have some neuroprotective uh, effects. But there's also the potential that because they can um, be immunosuppressive that they might impair wound healing and the body's response to, um, uh, to, to injury. So in my own clinical uh, uh, practice, I will use these um, when patients present um, very early after an injury, uh, particularly in people with a cervical spinal cord injury and individuals who are, don't have uh, diabetes and are not otherwise immuno immunosuppressed where the steroids might have um, harmful uh, side effects. And uh, this question is uh, for Dr. Schwab um, about deep brain stimulation. Um, so in Parkinson's disease, um, where deep brain stimulation has been used quite successfully, uh, the mechanism of efficacy is still debated in terms of network effects or the direct pathway of activation. Um, could you comment on the frequencies of stimulation that you chose for your study and the contribution of network activation to what you saw? So this is a very, very interesting question. In Parkinson's disease, the stimulation is at the high frequency, at the non-physiologically high frequency uh, in the routine uh, setups, and the stimulation blocks a certain pathway. Uh, which is overactive in the Parkinson patients. In our uh, approach, in our stimulations of this locomotor center in the midbrain, uh, we use low uh, stimulation frequencies. Stimulation frequencies, so number of impulses, electrical impulses per second, this is, uh, which are in the physiological range. And in fact, we see a stimulation dependent uh, result on the animal. If you stimulate with very low uh, uh, impulse uh, strength, then the animal stands up and walks. If we stimulate with higher strength, it starts to run. If we stimulate with even higher strength, it gallops. So the uh, stimulation we apply is in fact a physiological stimulation uh, that the system would also use uh, on the physiological, so normal condition. And uh, maybe uh, Dr. Failings, so um, is there a chance that deep brain stimulation might be in use clinically fairly soon for spinal cord injury patients or is it still too soon? Well I think that I, Professor Schwab's paper just came out, I guess, yesterday. Congratulations. So it's an interesting paper, and it's in, in rats. And, um, uh, of course, it, it will require additional work to try to work out the various uh, parameters and the various patients in which this could be applied. However, because deep brain stimulation is being used clinically, one could envision that the translational pathway would be shorter for this kind of a therapeutic strategy than for something else that was 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 completely uh, new. And uh, 
uh, on a topic that we've already briefly touched on, Jonas asks, are the regulatory agencies in the different countries just moving too slowly in um, approving clinical trials um, for patients with spinal cord injury? Well, it's a, it, it's a two-edged sword. So the, the regulatory agencies that have an important role uh, to maintain the, 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 the safety of the public and to evaluate these types of treatments. And so in the absence of regulation, then um, the public could come to harm. And the balance always is in terms of, of, of how, to, uh, how to really to strike this, um, this, this right balance between enabling research to occur but maintaining regulatory um, uh, uh, in, in, in integrity. For the most part, I would say that the regulatory bodies do a, do a good job. There, are, of course, always is um, the desire to try to move these types of treatments uh, forward. A few years ago in Toronto, we organized a conference called the Global Blueprint for, um, uh, Conference, and we brought a number of regulatory bodies, various stakeholders, researchers, physicians, funders together to try to talk about this in, in regard to, to stem cell uh, research. And what has struck me is that there is increased communication internationally between regulatory bodies and that the regulatory bodies are very open to scientific input in terms of trying to evolve um, their own methodologies. And uh, Dr. Schwab, perhaps you can give a European perspective. Yeah, I would say that this is very similar in uh, North America, Canada, the US, uh, and also the various uh, European countries. There are, of course, small differences, but overall, uh, these regulatory agencies have a very important role to make sure that the standards are kept and are uh, very high. Um, in countries uh, like uh, China or Mexico, uh, things are a bit different, uh, but we discussed that before. Um, uh, trials which are based on strong uh, science, uh, reproducible results, uh, have not to go to countries which have uh, relaxed uh, agencies or, or laws, uh, but uh, will, uh, will, will, will be realized uh, here in uh, the Western countries. And there's a, a question here um, from Nick about um, the current status of epidural stimulation. Mm -hmm. So perhaps I could, could answer to this because uh, we have groups doing epidural stimulation uh, here in Switzerland and uh, I'm uh, part of the uh, Christopher and Dana Reeve uh, Spinal Cord Injury Consortium where epidural stimulation uh, is also an important topic, also on patients. Uh, so. Uh, what you do in epidural stimulation is to stimulate electrically uh, through uh, a current uh, directly applied to the spinal cord, the uh, locomotor, so-called locomotor circuits in the lumbar spinal cord. And these then can uh, elicit uh, movements uh, like locomotion or standing. In order to be of any function to the person or the experimental animal, there has to be a small connection from the brain uh, which is still there and which can be trained to interact with this enhanced uh, drive which comes through the epidural stimulation. The procedure has been used in experimental animals very, very extensively and has been translated into human patients uh, a year and a half or so ago Today, five patients, to my knowledge, have been treated with epidural stimulation. They're all uh, former athletes, sports people, uh, which uh, train extremely hard together with this uh, new uh, epidural stimulation procedure. And uh, all of them have gained some function back. But uh, again, this is on a very experimental uh, scale. These are highly selected uh, patients and we still have a certain way to go uh, for a broader application. This is only one single site uh, in the US where this is, this is done at the moment in patients. And Dr. Failings, could you perhaps comment? 
Right. So the um, I think Mark, Mark Martin has uh, summarized it very nicely. So this has been a um, a very exciting strategy that has been um, uh, emerging, and uh, work that has been supported through the Christian Dana Reeve uh, Foundation. Our North American Clinical Trials Network, um, which are the uh, neurosurgeons and spinal uh, uh, surgeons, are quite interested in looking at this potential uh, strategy from a translational perspective. Um, it would appear to work best in individuals who have a severe incomplete lesion, where there are some circuits that are intact from the brain to the spinal cord. The concept will be to activate the, uh, the locomotor central pattern generators within the spinal cord and to try to mimic some of the inputs that this region will receive. What is important, though, uh, to understand is that um, there's a significant amount of training that's also required uh, to try to activate these centers. And in addition, there's a fair degree of fitness that is also required on the part of, of individuals with a spinal cord, uh, spinal cord injury. Again, I think coming back to a previous theme, this could be part of a combinatorial type of a treatment strategy and for a certain uh, a group of patients could potentially be used to, to augment the effects of other types of treatments. And just a, a, a final reminder for our audience in the closing minutes of our live chat, uh, please post your final questions in the comments section at the bottom of the live chat webpage. And I have a question here about materials, either natural or synthetic. What is the status of materials that are designed to encourage spinal cord regeneration? So this is a theme which uh, is around on the level of experimental uh, approaches in animals, rats and, and mice for a very long time. And many different types of material have been tried. The very negative outcome so far is due to the fact that the central nervous system tissue, the spinal cord tissue, does not tolerate these implants. So what happens when you implant uh, bridge material, this can be nanofibers uh, or uh, electrically conducting fibers, all kinds of things have been tried, many uh, really different things have been tried. What happens is that a scar forms around this. So rather than uh, fusing the two parts of the disrupted spinal cord, you have two scars and the implant is in the middle. So the problem that we still face in material sciences here is that these materials, whatever their origin, are not accepted by the central nervous system, by the spinal cord tissue, but are excluded from, from the tissue and therefore there's no integration and there's no healing or no bridging uh, so far. And uh, Dr. Fellings? Yeah, I think the uh, Mark Martin has alluded to the challenge which is really trying to define a material that does not uh, evoke a scarred response. The other challenge with many of the material-based approaches is they require an, in, an invasion of the spinal cord to make a cut in the spinal cord to introduce this type of a biomaterial. And as a, neur as a neurosurgeon, I would have concerns around, around doing this. Um, one of the exciting technologies that uh, has resonated with me is the use of self-assembling uh, and, and, and nanofibers which come in a liquid form one can inject these into the tissue and then these are self assemble within the um, in, within the injured tissue and the idea that potentially one could use these as an intrinsic structural scaffold to bridge the tissue again I, I think though that this is still at a stage where considerable uh, preclinical work needs to be done to to perfect these types of technologies and I think the final question goes to Brian Bard. So he says, in the mid-80s, 1980s, the Miami project was started with a promise to find a cure for spinal cord injuries in two to three years. And here we are, 30 years later, and it seems like we understand a whole lot more, but a cure still seems at least a decade or two away. What are your thoughts on this timeline? Well, it's always challenging to have 
to have timelines. I will, I will say that probably about 90% of what we do know about spinal cord injury has been learned in the last 25 to 30 years within that time frame. So we have learned a great deal. And we have seen advances in the treatment of individuals with spinal cord uh, injury. Again, these have been incremental advances. And I don't envision that we're going to have one dramatic breakthrough which is going to result in the cure. I think we're going to be chipping away at this problem and it's going to be incremental. Um, it's very important that we enhance our level of knowledge. It's not always apparent how we can apply this. Sometimes we can learn to apply this knowledge later on. But we are now um, in a remarkable era where we are now seeing a number of clinical trials moving forward at the phase one, phase two, and phase three levels. And I would envision that over the next decade, a number of these could potentially emerge um, as, clinical, as clinical strategies. And so as Dr. Schwab had alluded to before, the brain and the spinal cord evolutionary, on an evolutionary basis are incredibly complex. And you know, we're, it, it is remarkable that we have seen the advances that have occurred over the, last, uh, over the last few decades. And one can understand the impatience in terms of wanting to find a cures for spinal cord injury. But I really do believe that we have seen substantial advances and that we will continue to see these advances um, over the next um, 10 to 20 uh, years. But again, I want to come back to the concept that even small improvements can have a major impact on, on patients with, with, with spinal cord injury. And Dr. Schwab? I fully agree with uh, my colleague Michael Feelings uh, here. Uh, if we look at the Miami project, because you have uh, alluded to this, uh, they have, uh, or the researchers of the Miami project, had uh, made very important contributions to our uh, current understanding of spinal cord injury in the last 25 years. There's no question they are an important part of the research network uh, internationally. However, the term cure, uh, many of us feel this, and uh, Michael also alluded to, the term cure is the wrong term. Cure means you completely do away with the spinal cord injury. You go back to how it was before. The spinal cord injury is so severe and is such a severe disruption of a very, very complex system that what we can hope for is partial improvements uh, and, and partial recovery of lost functions, but a complete cure, a complete uh, disappearance of, of a spinal cord injury, uh, like a brain injury or a stroke, this is the same, is uh, not, not a goal which is realistic. We have to go in small steps and we will see small steps which come out of these clinical trials uh, and research directions uh, that are well underway at the moment. Well, Dr. Failings and Dr. Schwab, thank you both very much indeed for joining us today. And uh, thank you to our audience for a very lively debate. Uh, I want to thank everyone and just remind uh, everyone that today's live chat will, be, will remain archived on the live chat webpage. And please tune in for next week's science live chat, which will explore the science of fear, just in time for Halloween. And uh, our next science translational medicine uh, live chat will be November 14th with my colleague, uh, um, Dr. Megan Frisk. And she will be talking about neuroprosthetics and robotics, which is a, a related and very exciting topic. So I'd just like to say goodbye and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.